The peace of the Lord be with you, and uh, good day. This is our devotion for uh, Monday, September, September 21st, and um, our, our gospel lesson for this coming Sunday is from Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 17. It's the, the raising of the widow's son, and um, I'll be getting this out uh, kind of middle of the day, so we'll do the noon order of daily prayer in the Lutheran service book, and that's uh, found on page 296 of the, of the hymnal. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. Evening, morning, and noon I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fall. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. And as he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. And he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, as you entered into this world, you entered into this world um, to bring forgiveness, to bring life, to bring salvation. As we know that our suffering, that our death comes because of, uh, because of sin, we give you thanks for that forgiveness that you have won. That where that forgiveness is given, we would have that life and salvation. We thank you for the uh, demonstration of that work in the raising of the widow's son, that we would see that you are the one who came as God in the flesh, the one whose word carries that authority of God in the flesh, that one whose word does what it says, and that you are the one who has that power over life, of life over death. And uh, as you have that power, we pray that you would grant to us always to live in that life that is ours in you, in your resurrection in our baptism, into which you have joined us to your death, to your resurrection. And as we have all of the uh, all the things of this world around us that would cause us to fear, especially to fear death, that we would find our comfort in you, in the one who has overcome that death, that we would have eternal life in your kingdom, as you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, well, um, as we have this, this reading here, it, says, it starts with um, saying soon afterward, just, just before this, Jesus had healed the, the centurion servant. If you remember, that's the story where the centurion, the, the Roman, um, the, the, the head of a Roman uh, company, uh, the 100 men, that's where he gets the name centurion, um, a company of the, the army, um, you know, had a servant that, that needed to be healed, and, uh, and he... Uh, called upon Jesus to heal that servant, but he did so saying, you don't even have to come to my house. I know what it means to have, uh, to speak a word that has authority. And uh, I, say to, I say to this man, do it, and he does it. And, and so uh, I trust that you can do the same thing. And, and Jesus proves it and, uh, and commends the centurion's faith, commends the, the, that, that faith trusting, trusting the word to do what it says. And here we have that word doing that very thing, bringing life over death, you know, the, um, man, I say to you, young man, I say to you, arise, right? Um, so as we as we have that here, here Jesus is, you know, he did, did this uh, perform this miracle with the centurion, and then he, he he's traveling on. Uh, this is Luke. This is uh, before Luke nine, so this is before uh, Jesus turns his face to Jerusalem in Luke. So he's He's in, in the area near Capernaum. Nain is about, uh, my note in my study Bible said, about 20 miles southwest of Capernaum. So he's in, in that region there. And, uh, and his disciples there, a great crowd with him. 
And he draws near to the gate of this town of Nain, and behold, uh, there's a man, this is verse 12, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd of the town was with her. Now this is, um, this is, uh, you know, a big, um, big, a big deal here for this woman, right? This, this son has died, and, um, being carried out of the town, you know, they, they would have, uh, they would have buried people outside of the town, uh, in particular in view of cleanness. We're going to talk more about, uh, about that, that ceremonial cleanness here, here in a minute. Um, but they would have carried the, the body out of the town, and, but, the, but this, uh, this would have, as I said, this would have been a big deal for the mother because, because she's a widow and because this is her only son. And uh, it's interesting, you know, you hear that language, only son. Uh, the, the Greek there, monogenes, uh, the mono one genes, like Genesis, right? Um, it's the same word that's used, uh, in, in the same root word that's used uh, when it speaks of Jesus being the only begotten son. Um, so there's, there's an aspect where as the son is being raised from the dead, I think we can't help but think of Jesus as that, that only begotten son of the father uh, who, who's raised from the dead. Um, but I, you know, I don't want to make too much of that. It's just something I, I think it rings in our ears as we hear it. You know, I don't, I don't know that we want to go too far with that. Um, but this, this only son of this widow, the widow, I keep saying this, I keep saying this is a big deal to her. The reason it's a big deal is because at that point in time, it wasn't as though women went out in the workplace like like they do now, right? And so the the death of this son would have meant extreme uncertainty for her livelihood. Right, would have meant extreme uncertainty as to how she was going to provide for herself. It wasn't like she could just go uh, go out and apply to uh, to to work at you know the, the nearest office building or, or whatnot. Right, so she she's when he dies, she doesn't know where she's going to have her provision. You know, that was the responsibility of, um, of of husbands to their wives, the responsibility of of sons to their mothers. Right, you think about it. That's why. There's sort of a big deal made when Jesus says to, to John on the cross about Mary, uh, son, you know, man, behold your mother, mother, behold your son, right? And uh, woman, behold your son. Because he's, he's giving, Jesus is giving Mary to, to John's care. Um, and, and we see, what we, what we see then is Jesus having that same care here. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, right? I've mentioned that word before, that's this, you, the compassion you feel in your guts, right? He has that compassion in, her guts, in his guts for her, uh, because how is she going to be cared for? And, and, and then he says to her, do not weep. Now, it's easy to hear that and say, well, as Christians, then we should never cry. Right? You know, we should never get up, that upset about every, anything um, you know, because this is, um, you know, God's going to take care of us, and we just don't, we, we don't have to worry, so we don't have to cry, right? That kind of thing. Um, or, you know, that we shouldn't grieve, um, you know, when, when, when our loved ones die. Um, you know, this isn't Jesus saying, "Well, if you just had enough faith, you would you wouldn't be crying." Um, no, he's he's telling you, don't, "Don't cry, because because I know what I'm going to do." Right? In verse 14, uh, then he came up and he touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. Now, this would have been a big deal. As I talked about this cleanness, Jesus at this point would have been what's called ceremonial clean, ceremonially clean. He would have been able to go to the temple to worship. Uh, he would have been ritually clean. There would have been no concern with him going into the temple um, or, or, or the assembly, you know, uh, with the synagogue, that kind of thing. But at this point, what he would have to do is he would have to be unclean uh, for, for a day. And, and he would wash himself, a ceremonial washing, uh, and then he would, he would, then he would be, um, I can't write it, I should know. I think he would wash himself first, and then he would be unclean for a day, but then he'd be able to kind of re-enter society. Now, with Jesus, I, I, you know, we don't have, that's according to the law. Jesus, what he's doing here partially shows that he is greater than that. That the reason why death is unclean is because it's a byproduct of sin. But what does Jesus do? He takes sin upon himself. He, he is so clean in his purity, he can touch that beer, and instead of him becoming unclean, now death is, is cast away. Right? Uh, and look at what he does then. Uh, and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And with that word, that holy word, you know, what Jesus does is he, is he cleanses this death. Uh, he he brings, brings life out of it, right? Um, 
young man, I say to you, arise. And as we hear that, I, I think of uh, think of Jairus' daughter when, when uh, the Jairus is a ruler in the synagogue and his daughter dies and Jesus goes to their house and they're all weeping and he says to you, says, says to, to, to the girl, little girl, I say to you, arise, right? Same kind of thing, that's in Mark, but this is in Luke. Um, but that, that word, having the power to do what it says, that word, bringing life in the midst of death, the word, um, you know, resurrection is absolution. It, it is it is forgiveness, right? Um, why why do we die? We die because of sin. How can we rise again? Because that sin is forgiven, right? And so, so young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Uh, so Jesus giving you know that com that circumstance where the, 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 this mother's in. Jesus brings brings the young man to her. And, um, and think of that joy, right? Here he has life again. He sits up. He begins to speak. He's, he's back to, you know, this isn't, yeah, I think that the point is made there that he's not just kind of like uh, stirring. You know, he is, he is upright. He's fully aware. He's cognizant. He's active. You know, this isn't just kind of a, oh, this guy could have been, this guy could have been maybe not actually dead, and now he's stirring to life. No, this is, Jesus did it. You know, this guy was dead. Dead as a door now. Jesus gives him life, and now he sits up and he's, he's talking, right? So, um, and then Jesus gives him to his mother. The mother has this joy because now, not only does she have this son back whom she loved, um, but now she doesn't have all the fears that went along with losing him, too, right? And, uh, and what happened? Well, then a fear seized them all, and they all glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. You know, it's understandable. If somebody were ra raising people from the dead, I think we'd all be afraid a little bit, right? Um, in particular, though, why are they afraid? God is there. That's why they are afraid. This is God in their presence. And whenever you see God in the presence of people in the scriptures, they are always afraid. Why? Well, because of sin and because God is so great. You know, we've sort of turned God into to just kind of our buddy. And um, you know, God is so great and so good that when if we actually were to stand in his presence, there would be rightly be this fear because of our sin. Of course, though, we have this language, God has visited his people, and you can't help but think of um, of Luke chapter 1 with the, the Benedictamus, right? The, um, the the song that Zechariah sings to... Uh, to um, and this is this is Luke, you know. So same gospel, but the song that, that Zechariah sings to uh, John the Baptist, yeah, you know, speaking of how God has visited His people to redeem them, and that John will be the child to to go before the Lord to prepare His way, you know. But this is that visitation, right? Here is here is God visiting His people. Why? To redeem them, to bring that forgiveness, to bring that life in the midst of death. And as we live in that world of death, you know, as we have all of the fear of death that we have around us, in particular with something like the coronavirus, what a comfort we have in that resurrection. We have the one who has overpowered death. We have the one through whose, whose death we can, we can say along with Paul, um, in, in, if I recall in the Philippians, where he says in his letter to the Philippians, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Death, death shouldn't be gain. Death is the punishment for sin. Uh, in fact, we're going to see this with with the, the the widow in Zarephath, you know, that we had last week. She's she's back again this week with with her own son, and she says, because uh, her son dies, she says to Elijah, you know, why have you brought remembrance of my sin and this, the death of my son? Right, or sin brings consequence. Remembrance of sin brings consequence, and uh, and Jesus forgives that sin, and in doing that, gives us the promise of the resurrection, so that now to live as Christ but to die is gain. Death is not our friend. It calls death an enemy in, in, in 1 Corinthians. But through Christ, death has become what we could call, I guess, a, a useful a useful tool, right? Um, you know, useful servant, maybe even is a better way to say it. Death is now a useful servant that God uses to his own ends, that we would be united with him uh, in the comfort that we have in the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and then... To close then in this report about Jesus spread through the whole of Judea and the surrounding country. That uh, that word for report there is is word logos. You know if you um, you know we like when we have ologies right. That's a study of uh, that comes from the Greek word logos. That's a, the same word here. Report. It's a it's a um, it's the, the word that goes out about Jesus, uh, and they all hear this good news of what he does. And now we ourselves hear that good news uh, by the preaching of that gospel today, and. Uh, what a joy we have in it. Amen.
right. Uh, we'll continue with the, our order here. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to direct and rule us according to your will, to comfort us in all our afflictions by that resurrection of Jesus, and to defend us from all error, that we would be led into all truth through that same Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.